Hi, good morning, everybody. I'll just plunge straight in. Um, I've included um, Alma and Anastasia on the slide here, even the, um, because they've been sort of part of the journey that we've been on in the past year. And it's going to be just a little description of, of what has been happening on a more academic scholarly front. Um, and just quickly about who I am. So yeah, I'm a, I work in, a, in East London. I'm a family physician at Cecilia Makiwani Hospital here in Mtansane. Um, and I'm actually employed as a senior lecturer with WUSU. So I'm very much within the university space. I've got the six year medical students is under my um, char charge as well as registrars. Um, I'm also the convener for the Diploma of HIV Management um, for South Africa. And we actually, as part of that, I've been coordinating events for the HIV Clinician Society here in East London. And so we became involved with the trainings for the, the gender affirming healthcare guidelines. Um, as part of my diploma at work, I sit on the Council for the College of Family Physicians and on the Senate for the CMSA for more for um, uh, assessment side. Um, and then I'm on the executive committee for PATH SA. Um, let me just put off my video so we save some bandwidth. Great. Um, so this is what we all know, but it's just a little bit to remind us how recently it is that gender affirming healthcare is no longer considered something that happens within the psychiatric sphere or within the mental health um, arena. And it's in 2013 that it was taken out of the DSM-4, but I think a lot of our psychiatric department still uses the DSM-4. Um, that ICD-11, we're not yet using um, in the public sector, certainly in South Africa, but that was only taken out in 2018. Um, and it's only 2019 that there was sort of now an, an, an recognition um, right from the WHO that we are not talking about uh, mental disorder anymore when, we, when we're talking about trans medicine. Um, and I think the challenge is, is that that memo has not filtered through. And what we find is that a lot of doctors, as a matter of fact, the majority of doctors that I speak to is completely unaware of this um, and is not yet seeing gender affirming care as part of, of the medical um, circle. So you, um, I think you're all aware of the studies that have been coming out. There's been some very good studies specifically looking at access of care for transgender people. And then our latest Richard Shea Key Pops report from this year, um, again, showed the massive challenge with poor staff attitudes um, and even scenarios where healthcare workers refuse to provide treatment to people because they are trans. So I'm, we are looking at how do we now start positioning gender affirming healthcare as a part of medical care and how do we position it within that academic um, framework? Um, so I think obviously uh, also for just for about a Pele principle is that we need to now get to the phase where we really need to look at how does all healthcare workers get trained up on this information. And most of the prejudice that we are seeing is mostly, well, it's always due to ignorance and fear. Um, a lot of our healthcare workers, especially in your rural areas, are just completely unaware of even what even the terminology within gender affirming healthcare. Um, and therefore, we have a huge task in front of us also from an advocacy point of view of how do we roll that out. So this education intervention needs to happen at various levels. Um, and I'm obviously coming very much from a medical perspective, but this cuts across from all the different disciplines of healthcare workers engaged with trans care. So for undergraduate education, so how do we make sure that it appears as a module within um, the, the undergraduate, for example, our, our, our student doctors, within the relevant specialities. So there's particular postgraduate specialities um, that obviously provide care and then continuing professional education. So how do we train all of those doctors and people that are already in place? So I think from an education point of view, and that's what we're already doing extraordinarily within, um, within our field is interprofessional training, really having these amazing multidisciplinary team meetings. And I think that's the one thing that actually everybody else in the country can learn from us. But we do also need to focus at these at each discipline as well, because especially undergraduate and postgraduate training is still extremely siloed. So if you want to train many you know, student doctors, you have to actually get into the into the universities and into those curriculums. Um, and so our perspective was just looking at the medical field and our doctors, where do we find an academic home for it? The vision is to how do we provide then all clinicians with a training in gender affirming healthcare throughout their career, whether it's an undergraduate, postgraduate, or continuing um, as doctors. 
So at the beginning of this year, um, which is where our journey started, most of the trainings that's happening um, within gender-affirming care actually gets done through the NGOs for us. So the NGOs sponsor them, they invite speakers, they create trainings and various contexts. Um, a lot of the CPD is happening through professional organizations such as Path SA and Sasha, which provides CPD sessions. And those are very much at the moment focused for people who are interested and curious and want to know a little bit, know a little bit more. Um, our experts in the field, and we have extraordinary clinicians that has amazing expertise, but each one of them sort of, you know, you get it through doing an ad hoc training, attending some conferences, learning through experience and seeing patients. Um, and we therefore have sort of pockets of amazing people, endocrinologists, general practitioners. We obviously have our surgical people, um, speech therapists, occupational therapists, and other people from the rehab and the rehab field. And then, of course, your psychologists, social workers, lay counselors, psychiatrists, etc. Um, and the challenge is it's, it's very scattered about who is teaching what, where at the moment and, and what kind of um, access people have to trainings. And at the moment, a lot of trainings is still very much dependent on us putting trainings on, for example, and somebody going, oh, I'm interested in that or I want to learn more about that rather than really making inroads into the sort of um, bulk of, of healthcare workers out there. So we, we've been starting to look at how do we therefore position it in, into those curriculums. And I'm going to just look at some of the key milestones that's happened in gender affirming health since. Um, and um, I think the, the first thing that was very helpful was the, the National Strategic Plan for South Africa on HIV, TB and STIs. The first one that, came, well, the first one, the recent one, the prior one, better word, from 2017 to 2022, which... Um, showed that um, they, they created this uh, concept, key and vulnerable populations. Um, we all still find it very frustrating that it all happens under the HIV banner, but that's a little bit of a foot in the door, unfortunately, in terms of, of money and strategy, because everybody gives money to HIV. So um, transgender people was identified as a key population. And because of that, there was a strategic drive to create packages and programs for transgender people. And we sort of used that as a, as a way in. Um, so one of the major um, victories due to a lot of um, advocacy I know happening um, through various organizations um, in Cape Town and, and other places um, was that we now have within the, the EML, so I don't know, how, some of you might not be aware, we have an essential medical list in the public sector, which basically say what medicines are you allowed to prescribe and for which um, conditions. Um, and so in the tertiary EML, so that's the one approved for tertiary hospitals and above, um, we now actually have the gender feminizing regimen and a masculinizing regimen appearing. So both estrogen and testogen, testosterone is approved under the essential medicine list, which basically means that on a tertiary level, it's already now part of our medical programs. And of course, a lot of our advocacy is now getting it into the primary healthcare um, EMLs. So following that, in October of 2021, um, an extraordinary group of people uh, brought out this amazing guideline um, through the facilitation of the HIV Clinician Society, again, HIV being our sort of foot in the door, um, and created the Southern African HIV Clinician Society Gender Affirming Healthcare Guideline for South Africa. And that has given us a firm um, sort of orientation in terms of our training as well and engaging with different stakeholders. So in April of this year, myself, um, Alma de Vries and Anastasia, we all went to the, the family medicine section um, and they're particularly their education and training committee to start talking about where does gender affirming medicine belong? And what's been happening up to now is that gender affirming healthcare is sort of, you know, sort of fits under like vaguely under endocrinology, but we know it's, it doesn't belong to endocrinologists. They just do a very small part of the hormone therapy. It doesn't belong to the psychiatrist. It certainly doesn't belong to the surgeons. They're all just people who may interact on, on various um, aspects. Um, and I must say, even at that presentation, it was fairly clear that if you want to look at where family, where it should sit, family medicine is the obvious home. And even if you look at our family medicine principles, which is very much about looking after the whole patient, looking after the context of the patient, providing continuity of care over time. And so it wasn't a hard sell in terms of, hold on, as family medicines, we need to take responsibility for the training and the educating of gender affirming healthcare within our curriculum. 
So um, we particularly looked at those three different um, levels, um, undergraduate, postgraduate, and CPD, and has come up with some initial plans. Um, so there's, at the moment, we are completely revising registrar training. So these are people who are um, specializing and family medicine is standing at the forefront of that of that process. Um, and we are in the process of creating curriculum for post graduate family medicine training um, and means creating all where goes what. And so I'm on that committee. And so it's been fairly easy to make sure that gender affirming healthcare gets included in that. Um, from a CPD point of view, the SAFP, that's the South African Family Practice Journal, then invited us to write a CPD article for that journal, um, which would sort of give it a solid foothold as a, a continuing professional um, set of information that all doctors need to be aware, aware of. And then also we discussed at that time, although I haven't started engaging with this yet, um, uh, we've been placed with a committee that's, that's creating the Diploma on Sexual Health. They already have gender-affirming healthcare in there as well. Um, but to actually look at creating a module for an implementation plan for undergraduate curriculums. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we look at the way forward. So this is the article that was printed in July of this year. So it's in the SAFP journal, and that's very helpful to quote this and showing there's a, the, the, within South Africa, within family medicine, this is part of, um, of our, our um, academic background. Um, and then very excitingly, also coming out this year in parallel, and that's been been on development since last year, the HIV Clinician Society has created this amazing online CPD, also for doctors um, after they've graduated, um, on gender affirming training. Actually, it's interprofessional. It goes across the board for all the different disciplines. Uh, it's very easy to do. Um, it's about six hours. You get your CPD points immediately. It's completely free. And this is an ongoing resource that we can use for anybody who goes, oh, actually, I want to learn more. There's a free resource available to get yourself trained up on gender affirming healthcare. So lastly, I just want to quickly, um, so this came out in March of 2023 is the new national strategic plan. And I see the person after us is going to talk about the social and legal aspects. And I, I'll just therefore highlight some of the medical things that's actually in that plan for those of you that haven't looked at it yet. Um, and into the under goal one, which is looking again at key populations, the HIV thing still being frustrating, but we have a whole section now specifically for transgender patients. And you can see there at the bottom to intensify interventions to decrease primary, secondary um, and internalized stigma through the centralization of service providers such as healthcare providers. So it's in the strategic plan that we need to be centralizing all our healthcare workers. Um, and then specifically to involve transgender people in reviewing and developing pre-service and in-service curricula for service providers. So also this understanding that we are, are bringing this into training and to ensure that we involve all the right stakeholders. Um, in objective one is also in the legislative framework, particularly talking about promoting and supporting the implementation of gender affirming healthcare guidelines. So that's within the um, our NSP as well. And then in goal number two, where they're looking at um, the clinical aspects of including of priority actions, they're talking about including gender affirming packages at all service of levels of care and creating transgender friendly facilities in all service settings. So that gives us remit um, on that as well. Um, and then we are being logged, you know, this time we're being thrown in with the, with the drug users. Um, but under goal number three, there is a specific um, section in terms of harm reduction where they talk about getting uh, into the essential drug list our gender affirming our gender affirming hormones so lastly my tentative recommendations um i think we very much need to continue looking at how we within the normal cpd circuit start training up all doctors so we've been invited to present next year march we'll be presenting on the safp so this is family physicians postgraduate family physicians and we'll be presenting on gender affirming care in one of these cpd sessions um, and that gives us an opportunity now to actually go and encourage all family physicians, qualified family physicians, are you updated? Go and do the HIV clinicians online training. Um, we need to also now start looking at drafting a plan for the universities for the um, undergraduate um, 
departments. And I realized the way we have to do that is we actually have to go and train the family medicine departments at the different universities on gender affirming care so that they can include it in their curriculum. So if we train the, the profs, then they can figure out how where they want to put it in their curriculums. Um, and then in our registrar training in family medicine, so these are people who are specializing in family medicine, it's been included under the health promotion and disease prevention section. Um, which I think is helpful. We've taken it out from under sexual health because transgender health is not actually a sexual health topic. Um, and we will be, it will be part of, as we're starting to do work-based assessment, we will be looking at including that. I'm not sure when my 15 minutes is up. Hope I haven't gone over, but thank you very much.